for uh, first and second reading, the zoning amendment bylaw number 3883 2022 to permit a detached accessory residential dwelling at 3833 Gibbons Road, and that we authorize a public hearing for zoning amendment bylaw number 3883 2022 and authorize staff to give notification of that public hearing in accordance with the Local Government Act. Somebody want to move that? Moved and seconded. Any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? And opposed, that carries. Thank you very much. Takes us to item eight on the agenda, reports. Mr. Swaby. Mr. Mayor, item 8.1 is the uh, UBC Partnership Group, Forestry, uh, and we have a presentation, I believe, that should be queued up. Yeah, I have uh, on my agenda, I have Brad Seeley from UBC and perhaps Peter Arcees, I'm not Dr. sure. Dr. Arcees is here as well. Dr. Arcees is here as well, good. So, and it's a PowerPoint, so once again, if we could turn our videos off and um, welcome to those two gentlemen from UBC and the floor is yours and uh, we look forward with great anticipation to what you have here because we've waited a long time for this. Dr. Seeley, Dr. Arcees, welcome to the meeting. Thank you, thank you. It's uh... Brad Seeley speaking here on on behalf of the UBC team. I'd like to just say we're um, we're very honored to be able to make this presentation to the uh, <clears throat> to the council today, and uh, it's been um, it's been a, a an interesting project. It's been a difficult one in terms of the stops and starts and, and some technical issues, but um, one that I think has gone. Uh, quite well, considering. Well, there was that little thing called COVID that got in the middle of it too. So, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah, nasty COVID. Excellent. Okay, so I wanted to um, to let you guys know that there, there's a lot of material here, so I'm going to have to go fairly quickly so we can get through it all. I'm going to try to hit the highlights here, and um, you know, with the we had a, a meeting the other day with the Forest Advisory Committee, and there are many good questions that we and and we had a good discussion following that. Um, okay, so again, so just to recognize my other colleagues, Dr. Clive Wellam and myself. So we're also at Three Green Tree Ecosystem Services, as well as being um, uh, uh, honorary research associates in the Faculty of Forestry there. And then we have Dr. Peter Arcis and Dr. Stephen Shepard, who are also here. Can I have next slide, please? Okay, so. Just for, to provide some context, this is part of a, a larger project that we've been involved in. And um, so the broader goals of that uh, project are kind of laid out here. So that we started with a, a review of past management activities, you know, of the uh, municipal forest area uh, to give us some context about what's happened there and, and how we might move forward. Um, we worked closely with um, Sean and <clears throat> others there in the um, department to to develop the spatial resources that we would need to uh, assess this this uh, adequately. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time understanding management goals and coming up with different methods for evaluating outcomes. So the the part that I'll really focus on today is the multiple objective uh, scenario analysis that we conducted. But I'll also mention that we did um, do a report uh, previously about the feasibility of doing a, a carbon project. And that the goal of this whole thing is really to, to provide support for the development of forest management plans. So keep that in mind when we're talking about these scenarios. They're really the scenarios are designed to be kind of strategic and tactical kind of uh, analyses around how you know what are, what might the outcomes be if you if you make different kinds of management decisions. They're not really meant to be like this is specifically what you're going to do here on this land, this part of the land base at this time, and that that's more what we call an operational question, and that's something that Sean and, and his crew would be really dealing with later. Next slide, please. Hey, just <clears throat> you all, I think, are quite aware of this, but uh, just again, a little context. So this, the the forest lands within the municipal reserve are within the coastal Douglas fir, fir uh, ecosystem type which is one of the most imperiled ones in BC. It has a lot of species at risk. One of the reasons it's imperiled is that there's a lot of private land in this area and it's been developed over time. And so uh, conservation is important in this area. Next slide. And so just to provide some context again around the area we're talking about, right? So this, the area consists of six main holdings around the local mountains. 
a total of around just under 5,500 hectares. Um, it's been managed in the past, past for multiple objectives. Uh, and in particular, had an annual logging allowance of around 20,000 cubic meters per year. Next slide. Okay, so as I mentioned before, we, we started with a big <clears throat> putting together the spatial data resources. So there's many different types of data that we brought into our analysis here. We have ownership and boundary layers, forest vegetation mapping, past management, like where the harvest blocks are, streams, water bodies, sensitive ecosystems, visually sensitive areas, um, which we I'll be talking about them as VQO areas, visual quality objectives, roads and trails, and protected and culturally important areas. Next slide. Okay, so here's an example of some of the data that we looked at. So we had this um, high resolution, what's called LIDAR data. So this is laser mapping of tree canopy heights. And so we can use this to really um, take the, the forest inventory data and refine it quite, <clears throat> quite a lot. So we can see exactly where the trees are. We can see larger trees versus smaller trees. And it's, uh, it's a good way of refining the spatial data. So we spent quite a bit of time doing that. Next slide. So using the aforementioned data and some of the other forest cover data, we were able to then map out different um, stand types on the land base. And you can see we've identified uh, about six different stand types here. Some of them mixes of Douglas fir and other conifer species. Some of them uh, mixes of Douglas fir and uh, deciduous species, and some of them deciduous dominated. Uh, next slide. Okay, so <clears throat> talking about this multi-objective scenario analysis. So what we use here, so we, we, we bring in that information, the spatial data that I mentioned before, but we also have these different modeling tools that we use. So firstly, we, I'll start with the, we have a stand level model <clears throat> that was developed in the lab of uh, Hamish Kimmins, which I was involved with. And that's a model that's been <clears throat> active for 20 years or more and it's been developed and changed many times. And so it's one that's been applied. And the, the nice thing about this model is it doesn't just focus on timber. It, it also keeps track of many other forest and stand attributes that can be important for other indicators. Now this model then prepares information on those individual stand types and how they change over time. And it feeds it into a spatially explicit forest level model, which is called Forest Planning Studio, which was also developed at UBC by uh, John Nelson, who's now retired. Um, and it's, um, I like this model because it's very straightforward. There's several other types of uh, harvesting models out there that do a lot of like, um, uh, where they try to optimize, you know, using computer algorithms. So, and it's often hard to follow what's going on, but this one, it's, it's fairly clear to follow. Uh, so those two modeling tools, then we, we make projections at the stand level and the landscape level over a time period. And so we ran these models out for a hundred years, starting with the conditions in, in 20, 21. Um, and so the, we can then use them. They provide a wide range of output, um, including stand level variables and other variables that we can stratify and quantify at the landscape level. And we can use these to then uh, assess their impacts on some of the different criterion indicators, which I'll talk about in a moment. So the scenarios then that we, and I'll talk again, describe these in more detail in a minute, but basically these are the four scenarios where the status quo um, a reduced harvest scenario, uh, an active conservation scenario, and a passive conservation scenario. You can think of the scenarios one and four of, as kind of bookend scenarios where scenario one would be kind of the, the most harvesting and scenario two would be no harvesting, or sorry, scenario four would be no harvesting. Uh, next slide, please. Can I get next? Next slide. Oh, there we go. Okay, um, so here's a table kind of describing in general terms the, the four different scenarios. So you can see status quo on the left going over to the scenario four of passive conservation on the right. So the first row shows the, the, the harvest targets that we put into the, the, the landscape level model. Now the harvest targets are they're usually a little lower than what we had hoped to achieve because the model tends to always hit the minimum amount. And so what we ended up with is the actual harvest uh, cubic meters per year of around 17,500 in the, st the status quo scenario. Uh, 
In the reduced harvest scenario, it drops down to around 7,400 cubic meters per year. In the active conservation scenario, that's down to 1,300 uh, cubic meters per year, but that's only in the first 30 years. And then in the fourth scenario, there's no harvesting. Uh, then you can see in the next row, it shows the actual um, area that's um, actually harvested along with that cubic meters. The next one, we also, uh, this table shows that there's no harvesting in any of these scenarios in the preserve area, which is that eastern part of Maple Mountain. Uh, we have some built-in um, timber harvesting land-based uh, block retentions. This is the minimum amount of retention that you would have in any one harvesting block. So in the status quo scenario, would at least keep 15% of the trees, uh, where it is in the reduced harvesting scenario, you would keep at least 35% of the trees, and then the others they didn't have these uh, restrictions. Um, the next two rows are in relation to the active conservation scenario, which is these are areas that were identified as um, having uh, stands that we within to promote the development of old growth features. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And uh, the other one was the woodland restoration. Uh, and then the last two rows relate to um, the visual quality objectives. And the two things I'd like to highlight here is so uh, in scenario two, we used, um, according to the BC kind of guidelines and uh, regulations for these type of stands, um, in general, if you want, if you have an area that's defined as uh, an, a retention area, then you should probably try to uh, hit at least 80% retained within a block. If it's a one that's identified as a partial retention area, you should probably try to hit around 50. Now there's some variation around these and we'll talk more about these later, but I just wanted to bring it up. Now in scenario one, if I, when I first ran it, I tried to put the uh, restrictions on the visual quality uh, objective areas at 80 and 50, which is this, what I use for scenario two, which is the guidelines. But if I do that, I'm unable to achieve, the model is unable to achieve the harvest target of 17,500 cubic meters per year. So in order to achieve that, I had to drop them down to 55% in retention areas and 35% in partial retention areas. Okay, so we'll come back to that. Next slide. Okay, so now I wanted to show you some output from the um, forest planning studio. And so this first set of slides I'm gonna show you is in relation to the simulation of scenario one, the status quo. So just to remind you, the key features, 17,500 cubic meters of harvesting per year. The model sorts uh, stands that are just, that are eligible for harvest in such that they have enough timber and they're old enough based on oldest first. Um, as, I, as I said before, there's at least 15% retained in blocks. Um, we have increased retention in the visual quality uh, objective areas. Um, the model, I should also point out, tracks that in-block retention separately from the areas that are harvested. So it keeps track of some of the retain those older or the trees that are retained on the site. Uh, we assume that a stand, once it's harvested, it will regenerate as basically like the same stand type that was there um, for the harvest after the harvest. So it'll be the same again. And the other thing we have is we have what we call standard net downs. That just means that there, you're not allowed to harvest in like riparian areas and along roads and other things that um, normally wouldn't be harvested in. So those are all built in. So just to look at this graph here, this on the y-axis is the cubic meters uh, per, uh, of harvest in a year. And the x-axis is the actual year in that it's hard to see those numbers, but it goes from year zero to 100. So you can see that it <clears throat> kind of oscillates around the target flow line. And so the, in general, it's getting around that 17,000 cubic meters per year. Next slide. So <clears throat> this one is also a figure that's, or a, it's an, a screen that's uh, provided in the harvest scheduling model. And this, what this is, is just, a, it's a visualization of the landscape and in this case, we're showing age, stand age. And if you, so the, what you're looking at there is the, the white polygons are the ones that are with under nine years old. And as they get darker green in color, they get older. And so <clears throat> one thing I wanted to point out here is that you can kind of see where the, the past harvesting has happened mostly in the back country. And that was by design by the previous forester. It was easier to harvest in those areas because there's, <clears throat> 
you know, it's not as visible to the public and there's less people that are concerned about it. But now it's become, there's not as much of that area left available to harvest. And so if we want to keep continuing to harvest, we're going to have to start shifting that harvest into the front country, which is more visible. Okay, so I'm going to tick through this, these 10-year uh, time steps. Um, and each one you're going to look at, you'll see how where these new cut blocks are appearing. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so here's year 10. You can see there's some new white polygons appearing on the landscape and some of the other ones are starting to get greener. You'll see, I forgot to mention, there's the blue area in the middle there. That's that's a, a, a lake, so that's uh, what that is. Next slide. Okay, so again, some new cut blocks appearing. Next. 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 Okay, so you can start to see the reserve areas over on the east side of Maple Mountain over there. Those areas are just aging because there's no harvesting going on there. Uh, and then there are some areas that start to be harvested a second time because the minimum age for harvesting is, is 60 years on this landscape. Next. 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 And next. So this is what it looks like after 100 years. Now, one thing to point out here is that we don't represent natural disturbance in this model. Um, we could have done that, but it uh, becomes very difficult to kind of um, make sense of the output when you start to uh, superimpose natural disturbance events like fires and wind throw on this landscape. Um, and so to keep things simple here and from to support our strategic analysis, we, we left that out. But I do want to point out that it's not realistic to assume that you would not be getting any kinds of uh, natural disturbance events during this 100 year period. Okay, next slide. Okay, so now we're going to look at the second scenario, which is the reduced harvest scenario. And again, we'll look at some of the same things we looked at the other one. So key features here. This one has a reduced harvest rate relative to the status quo. So it's about 40% of the harvest flow from that one. Instead of sorting stands at oldest first, it, it sorted them randomly. Um, and this is because we didn't want to assume that oldest ones would be you know, the harvested first. Uh, so the type of harvesting that would be here would be mostly um, small openings and, and um, what's often called re uh, variable retention. There would be a minimum of 35% in block retention. And in discussing this with Sean and others, we decided <clears throat> generally these are going to, there would be increased uh, harvest costs associated with this scenario because we're asking fallers to do things that they don't normally do in these in these forest types or they're not trained as well and it just takes more time to do it. Um, the other thing I should point out here, and this was a point that was raised during the forest advisory uh, meeting, is that you have to be careful how you do this types, different types of variable retention because you can have negative impacts on, well, you can have quite a lot of wind throw that emerges with variable retention if you're not, if you don't do it properly. You can also have impacts on subsequent growth rates if you're creating systems where there's too much shade for, uh, to have adequate growth of the new regenerating trees in these systems. Um, okay, so next slide. So what we're going to do here is instead of going every 10 years, we're going to go every 20 years, just so you can see how this looks compared to the previous one. Next slide. Okay, so here's year 20. Uh, next slide. Next. Okay, so you can start to see it's a more patchy kind of landscape where you have some more older, greener stands over spread throughout the landscape. Next slide. Okay, so here's your 80. You can again see the, the east side of Maple Mountain has a lot of the mature forest, but there's more mature forest in general um, in there. Now, the next slide we're going to show you is just a comparison between the year 80 of scenario two and year 80 of scenario one, just so you can see the difference. Next. Okay, so you can see in scenario one, you don't have that distribution of all those uh, patches kind of in the other part of the landscape because there's just more harvesting going on. Uh, one thing that I should point out is that these, the slides here don't show the retention areas. Um, it just shows the age of the harvested areas. Uh, so there would be actually a little bit more retention that's showed on this, on this figure. But we capture that in the other parts of the analysis. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, scenario three, the one we called active conservation. Now this one, the key features here is that we decided we would 
we wanted to examine what we could do in, with respect to actually um, doing some things to improve conditions on some parts of the landscape. Um, so we looked at a couple of different options. One would be there are some woodland areas in the municipal forest reserve where these traditionally um, open, more open woodland areas are now being encroached by conifers because there's less fire activity that's going on here and, and other disturbances. And so those areas, if left unchecked, would become more dominated by conifers and less, they would look less like these open woodland areas. Um, so that was one thing we did. And the other one was we identified some stands using the, the LIDAR data to, that were these very dense um, medium age Douglas fir stands. And there's evidence to show that if you go in and, and thin some of these stands, you can actually promote the development of old stand features more quickly, such as um, understory reinitiation like shrubs and, and other things, and also um, just promoting the, the development of larger trees more, more quickly. Now, there are some costs of doing this, right? So these costs are, are high again, right? Because you're having to go into areas that are often difficult to get to. Um, there can be, so it's increased harvesting cost per uh, cubic meter. Um, the other thing to note here is that the, the value of the wood that you take out of these things is going to be mixed because it's not always the best trees you're taking out from a volume or timber perspective. And so, as I mentioned before, we're roughly treating about four hectares per year for the first 30 years here. Uh, that was the assumption we made in the scenario. And so that works out to around 1300 cubic meters harvested per year for those that first 30 years. And then after that, there's no more harvesting. So the, the map that you see on the right hand side shows um, the pink areas are these areas that we identified that are areas that have potential for woodlands restoration. This would have to be verified, you know, operationally, um, if this is something that we decided we wanted to do. Um, and then the other, the yellow areas are the areas that we identified as having, um, that they have the conditions where you could thin them and have some positive impacts from the thinning. Okay, next slide. Okay, and finally, uh, the forest scenario, there's not much to show here because there's not much happening in this scenario. The only activities here would be the fire smart activity would be included. And the only other harvesting activity that would occur in this scenario is if there were, a, let's say, a wind throw event or some other um, natural disturbance event that created uh, an, a place where safety was an issue in terms of like tree fall or that kind of thing, then there would have to be some harvesting there. But we, we didn't uh, simulate that specifically. Next slide. Okay. So I've discussed the actual scenarios. Now I want to talk a bit about how we evaluate the outcomes of the scenarios. So I mentioned those modeling tools provide a wide range of output, and then we use that output to assess what we call criteria and indicators. So the criteria relate to specific services or values that we associate with a forest resource and indicators we can use to actually measure those particular um, criteria uh, to see how they're changing over time. And I put a little diagram over there on the right hand side. Typically, we talk about economic, social and ecological criteria. And the idea being that somewhere in the middle uh, of those, if we're kind of meeting uh, objectives in each of those, we can talk about sustainable forest management. So just some other notes here. These, these indicators were developed over time with input um, during the public, the first public engagement process. And so we, we attended many of these different uh, group meetings and, and heard what the community was interested in. And that's kind of things that we tried to reflect in these indicators. Um, and then we also, um, so these are evaluated, as I mentioned, using model output, but in, in some cases, we also bring in our past experience working in other uh, landscapes and with other communities. Next slide. Okay, so specifically, I'll talk uh, just about the, the indicators a bit that we, that we brought in here. So we have the economic indicators first. So <clears throat> the first is the timber revenue. Uh, we can break that down into total annual harvested volume and also the net revenue of that volume after you account for how much it costs to get it from the, off the landscape. The second one was revenue associated with carbon. And so the, the first scenario, the status quo would not produce any carbon because that's what we call a baseline scenario. And so to, in order to generate carbon offsets, you have to do something that improves carbon storage in the landscape above what you call a baseline or a status quo. So the other 
three scenarios would produce revenue from that. Uh, and then the third one was recreational revenue. Now, this one, as it turns out, we were not really able to distinguish among the scenarios for a number of reasons, which I don't really have time to get into, but I wanted to put it in here just because it was one that was important when we talked to the community. And basically we just assumed that it's the same uh, among all the scenarios. Next. Okay, so now we have the ecological indicators. And um, so in this one, we identified five different criterion. So the first being sensitive ecosystems, the second being uh, protection and enhancement of mature and old forest and associated bird habitat. The third, uh, ecosystem carbon storage uh, and emissions. The fourth, uh, water services. And the fifth is uh, regional habitat connectivity. And so I don't really want to go into all these indicators specifically because we'll talk about many of them but just so there were different indicators that we we looked at in order to try to measure each of those five criteria that I mentioned and I will go through them in a minute here next slide okay now the final set of uh, criterion we looked at were the uh, the, the the social uh, indicators so we had uh, visual quality and this relates to the the visual quality objectives um, so we're looking in particular to the degree which those visual quality objectives were met in each of the scenarios. And again, we're trying to relate it as much as possible to like BC regulations and standards that are, have been defined and utilized in other areas. Uh, we also looked at one we called wilderness recreation. So this was like, um, starting with the, the sanctioned trail network and looking where that is and then quantifying the area around that network within a 200 meter buffer um, that was disturbed uh, by harvesting activities. Um, the third was the trail access. And again, this was one that was important for the community. So we put it in here, but we weren't able to distinguish among the scenarios. So we just assume that this one stays constant across all scenarios. And then the last one is uh, fire risk. And this is one that we, we were able to use the well-known sort of fuel type um, uh, indicator so that we can, that we can keep track of the different fuel types and calculate the fire risk rankings. So again, I'll talk a bit more about those next slide. Okay. So now I'm going to get into the actual results here. And so I'm going to start with, um, the economic indicators. And what you see here is on the left side is our projected net revenue from timber harvest. And this, this is dollars per year um, for each. And so I'm only showing the first 30 years um, because trying to go beyond that gets quite unrealistic, I think, from an economic perspective. And then so on the right side, you see what we project as net revenue from uh, the sale of carbon credits. And um, okay, so a couple of things that I want you to, to notice on this graph. So on the left, side graph the timber harvest one the the status quo scenario produces the most revenue particularly in the first 10 years of any scenario uh, and when you compare the compare it to the carbon ones as well it's it's higher um, but as the um, as the uh, time goes on the revenue from the carbon scenarios starts to exceed that from the timber scenario and that's because of some assumptions we make around the price of carbon the other thing to notice is that the reduced harvest scenario um, revenue from timber is actually lower than what it should be with respect to the percent of the, because, you know, it had 40% of the volume, but and it's, it's not quite 40% of the income because the costs associated with that harvest are a bit higher. Uh, and I'm going to show you some of the assumptions here in a second that we used. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see that the active and passive conservation scenarios were the best from the carbon perspective. However, the, the reduced harvest scenario still was able to generate some um, carbon revenue. Next slide, please. So this is just kind of a, I figured there'd be some questions about how we, the assumptions we use for this analysis. And so what I show on the left-hand side is the assumptions we use for the um, timber, assum uh, timber harvesting and revenue. So this was again with discussion with Sean and others um, about kind of what we would expect the cost per cubic meter to be on average. 
and what would we expect the price that we could achieve on average? And the way you look at the difference between those, and that's what the net value per cubic meter is for each of those scenarios. So you can see scenario one has the highest net value per um, cubic meter. And then actually scenario three, you're not actually making money off the sale of the timber just because it costs so much to do it. And the, the value of that timber is mixed because you know it was a mixed bag of timber that you get out of there. Now, there were some comments raised the other day that that price of timber that is actually lower than what it is right now, and that's true, it is lower. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to try to capture, we know that timber prices oscillate up and down quite a bit. And so we worked backwards a few years and came up with a projection that we think is going to be kind of a one going forward that makes sense um, on average. The other thing we assume there is that there would be a 2% increase in the net timber value per year, just um, based on trends. And then, so on the other side of the thing, the carbon side, we, um, we started with a, a value of around $25 per ton of, of CO2e. Now this is a bit higher than what we had in our carbon report that we did before, but we've noticed that with many of our, the clients within our three green tree network anyways, they're showing that carbon prices are going up and the demand for carbon is going up. And so we think that these prices are realistic, particularly for a, a high value project like like the um, North Couch and would be. This These numbers also include a startup cost of $175,000 and annual maintenance costs of around um, 20,000 and an uh, annual increase in carbon price of around 5%. Next slide. Okay, so moving on to the ecological indicators. Um, first one we'll talk about is the sensitive ecosystem areas. So again, we identified those in the um, landscape. And what we wanted to do here is look at area that was disturbed around those um, sensitive ecosystem areas. Uh, so any polygon that had at least 25% of a sensitive ecosystem identified there if there was harvesting around it. So what we found that was in the status quo, there was about 400 hectares on average that were being um, disturbed by um, the surrounding harvest and then that dropped down to 150 in the reduced harvest scenario and wasn't it was zero in the active conservation and passive scenarios um so then we looked at the disturbed area and key watersheds this is another indicator um so the the watersheds that we were looking at was the bonsall creek and the shimanus watersheds and so we recognized that the the Municipal forest land base is only a small part of the overall watersheds, particularly for the Shimanus one, but we wanted to still at least account for the impact of the activities in that area on that watershed. Uh, so again, we looked at, um, so the assumption we made was that an area that was harvested, it would take about 30 years for that area to recover hydrologically following harvest. And so that that area would still be, con would gradually reduce in its impact to the hydrology over time. So making that assumption, we looked at the average over the, the simulation period, and we found that um, about in the status quo scenario, it was about 330 hectares that were disturbed, which is about 15% of the whole um, watershed area, area within the um, uh, landscape. And that dropped down to only 8% uh, in the reduced harvest and 1% in the active conservation scenario. So I just wanted to point out that when we, when we start to summarize these um, scenarios in the end, we do take into account these different uh, relationships in area and disturbance, and we use those to uh, quantify them later. And so you'll see what I mean uh, when we get to the last part. Next. Okay, so another one we looked at was uh, recruitment of old forests. So the Municipal Forest Reserve had, was largely deforested around the turn of the century in, in, in that area. and you know, we've looked at maps with, with Sean that shows that quite clearly. So there's not a lot of older forests out there. There's little patches of it. But one of the goals um, that, and it was important for the community was to start to recruit this older forest. And I'm not saying old growth, I'm saying older forest over time. And so what, what we did here is we looked at the rate of increase in forests over a hundred years old. Um, and so we did that over a, a window of time and we did that from year 30 in the simulation over to year 70. And 
because prior to year 30, there really isn't much um, over a year 100. And so after that, it starts to accumulate some. And so as I mentioned before, this keeps this accounts for the area that's in the retention areas as well as, as in the non-retention areas. Uh, and so what you see here is that the passive conservation scenario accumulates the largest amount of old forest area while the um, status quo is the smallest amount. Now, it does continually, you know, accumulate some old forest because of the retention areas and also because it has areas like the east side of Maple Mountain where there's there's some um, mature forest going to be developing there. So to calculate the, to quantify the differences among these, we, we calculate a, a slope or a rate of increase hectares per year. And so you can see that the slope is about uh, twice as high for the passive one compared to the status quo. Next slide. Okay. Another one we looked at uh, was the um, habitat connectivity of mature forests, and this being forests over 80 years. There's several um, species that this type of forest is important for. And to do this, we also looked at uh, a broader area. So not just the municipal forest reserve, but if you look at that gra uh, the, the illustration on the left-hand side, this shows the, the broader sort of North Cowichan area and unfortunately, I don't have the lines showing the boundaries of the Municipal Forest Reserve in there, but it's in there. And so the green areas are the, the areas of habitat patch, so over 80 years old. Yellow is young forest, white non-forest, and, and the red boundary of the study site. And then so if we, we used um, a, a published habitat connectivity index that we were able to calculate on the landscape, considering both habitat inside and outside of the Municipal Forest Reserve. And what we found was that over time, the, um, the habitat connectivity drops in the status quo scenario and increases in the two conservation scenarios and stays, stays almost the same in the reduced harvest scenario. Uh, and I can show you some pictures of what that looks like over time. Next slide. These are just GIFs kind of showing, I don't know if the toggle thing's gonna work here. Okay, can you? Try to go next. Uh, yeah, okay, unfortunately, that's back there. So if the GIF thing was working here, which it doesn't work on this one, you would see that there would be a lot more green appearing in scenario four relative to scenario one on the other side. But the, just the way this uh, thing is set up, it's not working. Okay, next slide. Okay, <clears throat> the last uh, set of indicators, then we're looking at the social indicators. And so here's the, um, the VQO, uh, uh, visual quality objectives indicator. This is the one we were talking about before. So let's start by just looking at the, the illustration on the right-hand side. This is a map of the Municipal Forest Reserve. And so the light um, purpley areas are the areas that were identified as being um, retention areas. So th they require quite a bit of retention. Um, and then the, um, the other, the purple ones were the partial retention areas. Right. And so this was a study that was conducted for the Municipal Forest Reserve by a consultant. And this was a few years ago or a year. I can't remember exactly how long ago with COVID years mixed in there um, where they identified these areas. And so, again, some of this would be subjective, but they did use kind of standard methods to identify these. And so in these areas that were identified, we had the the areas and so we overlay these on the on the harvest polygons and then so we put the restrictions on them and as i mentioned in the status quo scenario we weren't able to meet the actual retention guideline targets because we just couldn't get the timber flow off it in that way um and then the uh reduced harvest scenario we were actually able to meet the um ideal um retention targets based on the bc vqo guidelines next slide so what I want you to look at is this new this table on the right now. So this is the we we developed a scoring system um, to try to simplify this a bit. And so what we did is the scoring system is based on the ratio of the actual um, visual quality uh, objective or score um, relative to the target. You know, so how much retention was there? Um, so if the um, if an area met the minimum retention target, it would get a score of 0.8. If it exceeded the uh, minimum retention target, the score could be above um, eight, but it would not go above uh, one, right? Because the score went from zero to one. 
Uh, mm -hmm. If it did not meet that reten minimum retention objective, it would be a score of less than 0.8. And so then we, we calculated the average score across the simulation period for the different scenarios. And so you can see the difference there, the status quo had a much lower score compared to the other scenarios. So 0.69 um, versus 90, a score of 0.9 in the reduced, 0.95 and 100% and in the passive conservation scenario. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, I believe this is the final indicator we're looking at. So this is the indicator around fire risk. And so this was based on the, the work that was done to develop the North Cowichan Community Wildfire Protection Plan. And in there, they define different fuel types. And these are standard ones that have been used in other parts of BC and across Canada, actually. So these different fuel types are identified because they have different fire risk. And, and really they're talking about these risks with respect to crown fires establishing that can be spread and be quite destructive. So the fuel types uh, include the one that's called the C2 type. And so this would be young conifer stands, mostly Douglas fir between years five and 20 years old. C3 would be slightly, um, well, definitely older stands. So this would be the ones, again, conifer stands that are between 40 and 80 years old. Um, these have a moderate risk, so the C2 type had a higher risk. Um, the pole sapling stand between 20 and 40 is C4. That also has a, a high fire risk associated with it. The C5s would be the mature conifer stands that are over 80 years old. And, and as the, the stands kind of get to that point, they have a, the crowns are higher off the ground and it makes it higher, harder for fire, crown fires to start. And so these are a lower risk stand. Uh, stands that have a considerable deciduous component are also lower risk, those are the M2s. And then stands that were just recently harvested within five years also have a relatively low risk. Um, and that's that slash fire type, fuel type. So each of these um, fuel types were assigned to those different polygons on the land base according to the stand age and the, and the stand types that we mapped out. Okay, next. Okay, and so this is the result when we put all those out there and we calculate the um, the score on average over time for these different scenarios. We find that, um, well, so one thing I wanted to do is, is to so quantify the risk score um, numerically. So instead of having just saying high, we want, we gave it a risk score of 10, a moderate had a risk score of five and a low had a risk score of two. Uh, we calculated the, the amount of area in each scenario, which you kind of see in those pie charts in the different types. So you can see in general, the status quo has more um, forest in the high risk type, where the uh, conservation ones have more forest, relatively less forest area in those um, types. There's not a huge difference among the scenarios here, but there is a difference. Um, and then if you calculate the average score that's area weighted on these, you can see that the, the, the risk score is a 5.4 for the status quo, and it drops down to a 4.7 in the um, uh, passive conservation scenario. Next slide. Oh, I lied, there was one, another one. Uh, so this is the uh, wilderness recreation opportunity um, indicator. So again, this was the area around this trail network. So as I mentioned, um, Sean provided me with a sanctioned trail network and you can see where it is down there. And we played around with different buffers widths on these and some places they use 400 meter buffers, um, some places they use 100 meter buffers. You can see the, the 200 meter buffer because the trails are pretty close together, it captures a lot of those, the area in there anyway. Um, what I did notice is that the results of the outcome wasn't very sensitive to the size of the buffer. So we stuck with the 200 meter buffer. Uh, the status quo one shows that in this area that we identified as buffer, around 233 hectares on average are disturbed by harvesting within that uh, area. So you would have less of a wilderness experience if you were in there, that's the idea. And it worked out to about 16.5% of the total buffer area. That dropped down to 6% in the reduced harvest scenario and zero in the others. Now, these trails, of course, are going to have natural openings and viewpoints and things on them. 
And there was some discussion about, well, it's nice when you go through a clear cut, you can see views and so on. And, that, and that's true in many cases. But again, so we weren't necessarily measuring that. We were measuring what we call this wilderness recreation opportunity, which was something that was identified as important during the public engagement process. Next slide. Okay, so finally now what we're doing is we're, we're come to the point here where we're trying to come up with a way of looking at all these indicators at once and trying to compare these different scenarios together. So this was a, these figures are ones, it's based on a, a publication I came across where they tried to do a similar type analysis. And I thought this was kind of a nice way to kind of show these things. So basically what we did is for each of these indicators um, and criterion, we came up with, uh, we, we used the numerical values that we talked about for just as I, I showed you as we went through there. And then we were able to assign a value between one and eight on here when one being very poor and eight being very good and sort of, you know, right in the middle there, I guess it was a value of five would be satisfactory. Right. And so you can think of satisfactory as a way as it kind of meets minimum, um, guidelines for the, uh, provincial sort of forest guidelines. Um, so with that in mind, the first two scenarios we're, we're looking at here are the um, status quo and the reduced harvest. So you can see that for the status quo, for many of the social and ecological indicators, they're either at or below satisfactory. Um, and for some of the social indicators, the wilderness recreation and the visual quality is, is, was given the score of satisfactory minus. Now, the one thing that's obviously stands out in the status quo scenario is a very high score. And it was actually the highest score achieved by any scenario was in the economic one was the, the timber revenue was very good in that one. Um, okay. And then when you look at the reduced harvest scenario, um, what you notice is there's not too many that are below satisfactory there. There are the only one that came up was below satisfactory was the timber revenue. Uh, and as I mentioned, because the costs of getting or the, the, the costs are, uh, increase of getting that timber out, um, wilderness recreation is better, uh, than status quo visual quality is better. Water service is better sensitive ecosystems. Also many of the ecological ones are slightly better in that one. Okay. Uh, next slide. And then these two again, show the final two, um, scenarios. And what you notice here is a, a lot more green, particularly in the ecological and social um, criterion and indicators. And um, <clears throat> one thing that it's sort of clear is there's not a huge difference among these scenarios because that active conservation one, again, was only a relatively small amount of harvesting that was going on. Um, one thing you do notice is this one has a slightly higher carbon revenue. And um, yeah, that's really the main thing among these two. So the last thing I wanted to point out then is what we, we wanted to actually come up with a, just a general scoring system. Now, if we assume that all these criteria, all these different criteria are weighted evenly, we can evaluate these scenarios uh, against one another numerically. And we do that by just assigning the numeric score. So again, the very good would give you a score of eight, and then it goes down by one good would be a seven satisfactory plus would be a six and so on all the way down to very poor would be a one. So if we go to the next slide, using that scoring system, we take the average score of the ecological indicators, the economic indicators and the social indicators. We can then calculate a, a score for each of those sectors, um, for each scenario. And the fact that there's more ecological indicators doesn't help the ecological score, right? It just, because it's an average of those ones. So if we look at the average score, then, um, across those different indicators, you see that the, the status quo has the lowest overall score of 4.5 and the passive conservation has the highest score of, of 5.9. And, um, if you look at the economics section, um, the status quo is similar to the reduced harvest followed by the active conservation and passive conservation scenarios. Um, but they're not too much difference among those. And then the social scores tend to be higher in the conservation scenarios. Um, okay. Next. Okay. Almost coming to the end here. So I appreciate your patience in getting through this. 
Um, <clears throat> so again, these scenarios, it's important to remember what I said at the beginning, that these are meant to be strategic and tactical kind of analyses that we're looking at. What are the impacts of general kind of approaches to forest management in this area? We're not saying any one of these scenarios is the way that's going to happen. That's up to the, the management team there uh, to decide that with input from the public. This is just to help the help them provide summaries for the public engagement process. There is a potential to run some additional scenarios. I would say, you know, the budget has basically been exhausted so far, so it would, it would require additional budget to do that. And I'm not sure that at this point there's additional benefit until we kind of go through the, the process of running additional scenarios. Um, we will prepare a written report to summarize this information uh, for the North Cowichan and then all of the data sets and models and things that we prepared will be transferred to Sean and his team there so that they could do additional things with them in the future if they like to. Next. Maybe that's the end, I can't remember. Yes, that was the end. All right, well, thank you very much for your attention. I know that was uh, a lot to get through and so I, I'm not sure what the, I guess there'll be some time for questions from the council here. And that's pretty much what we intend to do now is uh, yeah. if you could leave your camera on, sir. Um, I'm interested in questions from council. I have some questions myself, but I'll hold those. I see uh, Douglas was first, then Justice, and then Matt has Go ahead, Councillor Douglas. Mr. Mayor, I think I was after Councillor Justice and Matt has. Oh, I, I saw you first, so I'll let you go first. Go ahead. <laughs> All right, thank you. Th through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, to uh, to Dr. Seeley, um, with, with regards to the active conservation scenario, are there any examples of this, um, perhaps in BC or other parts of uh, North America that we we could learn from uh, for such an approach, or or would introducing that uh, scenario in North Couch and really be trying out something a bit more new and innovative. Yeah, so the, with respect to the thinning ones, there's definitely examples of that uh, I've come across before. So that one would be more common. Um, in the case of the woodland restoration, I believe there are some people doing that. I think um, I can invite Steve, uh, sorry, Peter can comment. I think he is aware of some things. Peter, are you there? Dr. Ashes. Maybe he walked away from his uh, way. He might have, uh, yeah. So uh, you can come back to that one. But I think he had said that there there were some people looking at that. And so, but that one would be a little bit more innovative, innovative I would say. Oh, I see. Oh, Peter, there's Dr. Ashish. Go ahead, sir. Thanks very much. Sorry, I wasn't able to unmute there. I'll just say that uh, Brad's exactly right. There's a lot of good examples about how thinning uh, young forests can advance biodiversity uh, and and uh, get you some timber revenue. In the case of woodlands, it has uh, it's something that's kind of particular to our area. Except there's a lot of experience in oak woodlands in the eastern U.S., which are not too different than our oak and arbutus woodlands here, which are the ones that are of course of high conservation value. And yes, the idea uh, is is pretty well established that uh, that uh, the kinds of thinning that Brad described uh, can enhance substantially the ecological values of those places. The only example that it's been done extensively locally though uh, is on Waldron Island uh, where Waldron is just across the, the border and the Strait uh, and the Haro Strait from, from the Southern Gulf Islands and there the Nature Conservancy has done a lot of work in order to enhance uh, Gary Oak groves to, to very good outcome and there are published papers actually documenting the growth of those uh, trees subsequent to that kind of treatment. But you are right in kind of guessing that it's a little bit closer to an experimental treatment than one which is well demonstrated when it comes to woodlands. So, Mr. Mayor, uh, Councilor Douglas? Yeah, just, just one follow up with regards to the thinning uh, of the forest. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, Dr. C or Dr. Arcees, if you know the late Ray Travers, who was a well-known forester in this province, but he was always a big advocate for learning from some of the techniques of the uh, Scandinavian countries in terms of, uh, of commercial thinning, thinning and wondering if the, we could learn any lessons from their approach uh, if, if 
North Couchin were to pursue, uh, say, option two or three? Um, Brad, Brad, oh, Brad, Brad will have some comments, but I'll just say quickly, you might remember that uh, at the first presentation we gave, uh, Verena Greece was part of our team, and she's now uh, in Zurich, uh, the University of uh, um, Zurich there, doing work. But she had a lot of experience in that, and she was an expert. And yes, I, I think there's a lot of experience with small track, feller bunchers, and other kinds of things for those, those kinds of techniques to be put to work. And they're potentially something that could be done in our forest where there's a lot of concern often about the disturbance that the equipment does while it's in the forest. And so in Northern Europe, they are particularly good at coming up with those schemes. However, as Brad has noted, the cost of doing that will always depend on the availability of the equipment, and the experience of the local operators. So far, I think there's a little bit less experience locally. So it might, uh, Brad could comment more on the likelihood that that would affect costs uh, or be done efficiently. Mr. Seeley. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I was distracted by a text out. It was from Sean, so you can blame him. <laughs> I, missed the, <laughs> I missed the start of that question. Just talking about about how we could use some of the European uh, models here in terms of the. I see, yeah, and so I, yeah, I would I would agree with what Steve uh, what Peter said is that uh, yes, there are some examples out there, um, and uh, but it comes down to like having the right equipment and the expertise, you know, and so it's not always as easy as as it looks right to do that stuff. Council Justice, then Manhurst, then Marsh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and thank you, Dr. Seeley and Dr. Arcees. Really uh, fantastic work and really interesting and, and uh, deep pre presentation. Um, I, I reckon there may be an assumption in my, my question that turns out to be sort of faulty or something, so maybe you can. Um, just correct me if I'm wrong, but and I recognize that these are pretty highly abridged scenario descriptions, but they do to me to appear to be sort of oriented to harvesting schemes only, especially for scenarios one and two, and not to replanting schemes and other aspects of forest management, like thinning that you uh, you touched on in your discussion of uh, scenario three. But myself, I'm I'm sort of equally concerned with what happens after harvesting, um, specifically the conversion of our naturally regenerated, though young, young aged um, forests to um, essentially monocultural stands with very limited diversity, which is, I guess, the sort of usual practice after the historical harvesting that we've been doing. So I wonder, if will, will replanting regimes and schemes for managing the, the growing forest be part of the more developed scenarios that go out to the public, or would that involve running additional scenarios? And do you think, I guess, would, would the ecological outcomes be different for, for say, scenario two, if we're looking at, say, planting a diversity of tree species with, with um, spatial, spatial differences at different spots and, and so on, instead of, uh, instead of creating a, a sort of a industrial feeling monoculture yeah okay that's an interesting question um so first thing i would say that these many parts of this coastal douglas fir are actually fairly limited in species sort of mixes and with you know in terms of conifers anyways there's not a lot there uh, they tend to be you know the naturally regenerated stands that come after fire tend to be dominated by uh, Douglas fir. Of course, there would be areas that would have the the woodland types in there that uh, that Peter was talking about. Um, now, yeah, from a from a modeling perspective, I would say most of the things that we looked at wouldn't be much different if you were planting different uh, tree species there. And in general, you know, from also like from a forest management perspective standard practices today are are starting to to plant more diverse species anyways right where where it's suitable for the ecosystem type right so you need to do what you know so my former mentor uh 
Hamish Kimmon said, you always had to have respect for nature, right? You had to think, look at what was, look at the ecosystem conditions and plant the tree species that are appropriate for there, right? And when it comes to this particular climate zone, and when you think about climate change, it's often difficult to know exactly what's appropriate in some of these, right? Because the climate's changing. For example, um, cedar and hemlock are, are, it's becoming pretty dry for them to, to survive in some of these uh, ecosystem types. Um, and so they're ones that are probably going to become less common on the landscape. Um, I guess the, to answer your question is that I personally don't think that's something that would warrant additional scenario analysis, but I would say it's something to think about, you know, when you're doing operational planning and that is, is if you are going to uh, harvest an area that you should take into account some of the things going forward in terms of like climate and conditions of the site and local, you know, micro site conditions when you're planting species back there. And those are things that Sean and others would be well trained in doing. Follow up. I'll, just, I'll just add quickly, if I could, Council Justice, that um, I think, you know, all those tree diversity and the diversity of plants will will affect overall diversity. In our area, the main thing that will enhance that native biodiversity will simply be more and extensive mosaics of old forest habitat. And the reason is because that's the habitat which was here historically, and that is the habitat which is most reduced. So the kinds of species that the province and, and federal governments are looking to protect in the Georgia Basin and that bio, the biodiversity and the communities associated with them is best predicted by the amount and juxtaposition of intact or mature forest, CDF forest habit, habitat, as opposed to the specific trees that are there. Although, as Brad says, of course, and as you would know, the more diversity of those habitats, the more diversity of the associated species associated with them. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, may I ask one more question? Follow up, sir, go ahead. Sort of related, I think. Um, so I understand that our, our forests here are of two major types, so there's the coastal Douglas fir marine maritime, and there's also the um, the coastal western hemlock, very dry marine. Um, as the presentation notes, and I think we're all familiar with the idea that the coastal Douglas fir marine maritime forest is highly imperiled and um, is home to a great number of endangered species. I, I'm much less familiar with the ecological status of the the, uh, the western hemlock um, forests that we've got here. Um, is it equally precious and is there an ecological case for managing the two forest types differently? Peter, do you want to start with that? <laughs> okay, I'll say quickly, you know, uh, it, I mean, whenever we set conservation goals, that's always going to be somehow related to, to what's there historically and how how much of that you want to try and protect given your specific species goals. The, the coastal western hemlock, the, the warm maritime. Sorry, Dr. Rice, you should break it up. The Douglas Fir Partnership included that in the CDF because there was, oh, excuse me. I will say that the coastal Douglas Fir Partnership uh, has included the two for the same area because they feel they are substantially similar. Uh, but you are right that they have different ecologies. I'm Dr. sorry, sorry for that. I can't, uh, I'm not no, sure what's it, happening. It, it, you're, you're breaking up. What we found based on two and a half years of doing this, sometimes it helps if you turn your video off and we can hear you better. I will do that. Because it's just a limited bandwidth at your end. So I'm sorry, could you answer the question again because it got pretty <clears throat> interrupted, go ahead. I'll try it. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I, I will try and say quickly that the Coastal Douglas Fir Conservation Partnership recognizes the two forest types that Councillor Justice was mentioning as more or less being managed in the same group and equally in peril. Uh, as climates change, the boundaries of those are changing. And of course, it, we're just looking broadly at that, uh, at both of them as being similar. And so, no, I don't think there would be special management for either. Anything to add to that, Dr. Sheely? No, I think that captured it quite well. Okay, thank you.
And thank you, Dr. Essie. You can turn your camera back on so we know you're there. But uh, if that happens again, we just find that that's sometimes uh, the, 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 the best way to deal with this. I've got Thanks Man Asked in Marsh. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Mr. Seeley, and your team for your presentation. I've got two questions. Um, are, are, uh, we were licensed for an annual allowable cut of up to 20,000 cubic meters per year. And since 1987 to 2021, which is 34 years, we've only had our average has been 15,000 cubic meters. In the last couple of years, we haven't done anything, so actually that average will be going down. But you're using the average target price, uh, average target of 17,500 cubic meters. Uh, why is that? That was one where we we looked back a few years, and this was. Uh, done when we first started doing this um, work back, I don't know, a couple of years ago. And and my my estimation, we dropped out a couple of the years, um, the more recent ones, because, you know, things obviously got paused while they were waiting for this process to go, right? And so that's, that's basically how we came up with the 17,500 was that similar sort of approach, right? Okay, but because about my calculation from 1987 to 2021, even leaving out the last couple of years, is 15,000 cubic meters average. Anyways, um, and my other question is, you guys have the company G3, I do believe. And yes. Does your company still um, act as a middle person for buyers and sellers of carbon credits? Um, as a middle person? No, I mean, what we do is we help develop uh, forward carbon projects. We can do that, yeah. And you do get paid for that. We would. Yeah. I mean, is it is it a broker? Is it a brokerage thing? I, I think that's what he's asking. No, it's it's not a brokerage thing, right? So it would be it would just be so we would work with a, a landowner to and they would pay us to help them uh, develop a, a carbon uh, plan. Yes, but yeah, I wouldn't do it for the North Cowichan one because it would be I would think it would be a conflict of interest. Okay. Um... Okay, because uh, when I asked this question last time, I think it was Mr. Wellburn that asked a question, answered that question, and it was more like a brokerage, the way he answered it. Thanks. Councilor Marsh. Thank you, and um, thank you, Dr. Seeley and Dr. Arcis. I uh, I'm regretful that uh, that the timeline didn't work out, and you had to had other work i understand of course and um but here we are today and i'm grateful that you're here and i'm grateful for all the work that you've done um something really stood out for me that i think i need more explanation on and um on in one of your slides you talked about the impacts to to recover hydrologically after harvesting would be 30 years so I guess I'd like to know a bit more about that. What does that mean in terms of viability of replants, et cetera? But I'm also curious, have you modeled out to what um, climate science is saying is going to be happening? Because um, we're in election season, as you know, and uh, those of us who are pounding signs in, they actually have to use a very heavy metal thing to make a hole because it is just so dry. And we've now got this little anecdotal um, description of the month as October, because our, our days are still fairly warm. So I'm just wondering if you could help me understand more. Uh, whenever I think recover, I think, well, something's wrong. And if it takes 30 years to make it right. So maybe I'm off base. I, I'd be happy to hear from you. Thank you. Yeah, and so I can, I can respond to that. Um... So typically when, when um, forest management plans are being developed, there often are restrictions on what you call equivalent clear cut areas within watersheds. And this is based on the fact that we know that when you remove trees from a landscape, it changes the flow of water through that landscape, right? So trees can slow the flow of water quite dramatically through a landscape and you get less, much less runoff. And uh, so it just helps to regulate things so it helps from a, a water quantity perspective, but also from a water quality perspective. And so it's like a filtration process as well. And then the other thing that trees do obviously is they they transpire water and so that there's water going back up and so they can also affect local climates that way. Um, so yeah, you made the point that yeah, we're in 
right now in a record drought that's never been seen in this area before, at least not in recorded history, you know, for how little rainfall, particularly on Vancouver Island. And as the soils get drier and drier, they became, they get less permeable to water, right? And so if it does rain, you get more runoff. So, but to get back to your question about the 30 year one, there's been several studies that kind of look at, so they put in weirs and other things around uh, watersheds. And they found that it's basically almost a linear increase or a linear pathway from, from time zero to time 30, where by at year 30, you've kind of, you're back to what the previous forest was with respect to a hydrologic con condition. So a 30 year old forest is almost you know, say a 29 year old forest would be 99% of the way back there, right? In the way the assumption is. And so that's just the way. So it, of course it's, it's a simplification of what really happens out there, but we have to simplify things when we're trying to, to model them, but I think it captures it reasonably well. I don't know if Peter, if you wanted to add anything to that. Um, thanks. I, I will just add quickly that one of the things, uh, in addition to what Brad has mentioned, that uh, there are large scale experiments in coastal forests, which is very much like our Douglas fir forests in Northern Oregon. They've been published extensively. I could send you the kinds of uh, articles if you'd like to see them. But what they've done is, is actually experimentally harvested the watersheds to show that the amount and volume of water. And so they've demonstrated those water regulation services. And even though the hydrological capacity of stands increases, and, or as Brad noted at year 30, the regulation services, the degree to which watersheds show equal, or equal in outflows of water through time and the total amount of water in Oregon coastal Douglas fir watersheds is increased dramatically as you increase the rotation length. And so it, it, it's maximized in those experimental forests at a rotation longer than 100 years. Right. So I still think I'm, I don't know if I understood your answer and forgive me if it did include, are you able to model or are you, are you including the potential of what, um, of a continued drought and a continued higher level of of heat for longer periods and how is that built into this? That's I'm not clear about that. I'll suggest, Brad, that, you know, Councillor Mars, that's an excellent thing and we would do it if we could, but I think you'll be aware that there are enough scenarios about future climate and that each of those are modified so much by the local conditions that what we can do is really make broad scale arm waving things that we know it'll get drier and that the frequency of droughts will increase but it's very hard to make precise predictions about that if right. hydrologists uh would be uh, would be the kinds of people you'd need to do that and right now i would say that there's even discussion among them about the proper way to model it because of this interactions of forest age transpiration changes in rainfall pattern which are also happening simultaneously uh, you know, with other kinds of changes going on. Thank you, Peter. Can I ask one quick more question? Here? One more follow up. Sure. Go ahead. So would it be accurate to say, um, and I don't have all your things in front of me, but would it be accurate to say that the, that the more we keep the older trees and the mid age trees in the forest, um, the more likely that the hydrology of supporting future uh, growth would be in a positive way rather than a negative way? Or do you think it's... It, if positive is greater stability or less variable water flow and higher quality and abundance of water, yes. But let me be clear that the forests you manage are, you know, of enormous value, but they're only 5,000 hectares in a fairly large watershed. So, certain, so, so that, for instance, the effects on the Cowichan River of managing your 5,000 hectares might be difficult to, you know, to measure. Sominos or Bonsal, maybe a little bit easier to do. So it's kind of, it, it's also a proportionate effect because, of course, you don't have control of the entire watershed. Right. Thank you very much. Councillor Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's um yeah, it covers a lot.
I just noticed in your economic scores, the uh, the total is the same for scenario one and two, but I know scenario two will be more costly to do harvesting. Can you explain why the scores came out the same? Uh, I don't think they came out entirely the same. I think the one was a little bit higher than the other one. They averaged 4.7. Okay. I'd have to look back at my... Just in that chart. Right. Um, oh, I know why, because, okay, here's why, because um, the reduced harvesting one got, it had a much lower input income from um, timber, but it had a considerable income from the carbon, right? So that was the made of difference there, yeah. Because it was a blend, right? Yeah, it was a blend, yeah. That's right, thank you. And then if we were looking at scenarios, um, I'm anticipating that through our, our conversations with Couch and Nation that um, there may be areas identified as cultural significance that we might want to remove from harvesting potentially. Um, yeah. So how would that work? Would that be something that we would look at after this public engagement section or beforehand? That would be... I think Mr. Swaby wants to answer this one. Okay. It is a great question and it is something that I was going to... Uh, provide for council as I did for the forest advisory committee is that uh, the there could be other scenarios that we want to explore that come out of our um, engagement with First Nations uh, and that's a very good point that's being raised that's one of the very important issues that First Nations have about the forest uh, the culturally significant areas so there there is the potential that we will be looking at some other uh, factors that come out of that engagement so that would be after the public engagement is complete? That's correct. That, that engagement is, is separate uh, from the public engagement. Okay. And are we talking today about the how the engagement will go, or are we just sticking to the scenarios for now? Uh, we'd be welcome to answer any questions and, and clarify anything uh, about the engagement process. We thought we'd, it is part of the report and, and certainly open to any input that council wants to provide us because the the, the recommended motion here uh, is that we accept yeah. the scenario report and then direct staff to proceed with round two of the forest republic engagement so and so, that process has been spelled out there are expectations there correct mr swaby in in terms of what mr mayor in, in terms of what that round two of public engagement would look like yes we brought that forward to council and we certainly yeah. can um, answer any questions you have about that Councilor Sorry. Um, so will Dr. Seeley and Mr. Ortiz be a part of that? Or should I, I'm, I'm wondering if I should see the floor and then do engagement questions after or now's the appropriate time, sorry. I think that would be uh, preferable is that we get through the, uh, okay. the work that they did and then we can have a good discussion about that and bring in our communications manager as well. Okay, okay so um, uh, hold on, Councillor March. I haven't seen anything from Councillor Toporowski yet, and I have a couple of questions as well, and then we can maybe start round two if we need to. Councillor Toporowski, anything to add to all this in terms of questions for the UBC folks? Um, thank you, Mayor. Um, thank you, Mr. Seeley and Ursis. Is that how you say your last name? Thank you. <laughs> there you go. It's like Toporowski. Sometimes you can't pronounce that. <laughs> But um, thank you so much for your presentation um, and the scenarios that are coming forward. And I'm really looking forward for this moving um, and the other input coming from our community in the next steps. Also, my question was around the cultural areas, the cultural sensitive areas. And I do have some ideas to share in regards to other other nations that have moved forward and bringing those forward to community so i can't wait to add that input but um yeah and also the scenarios two and three i noticed that um i think it was maybe three and four uh, i can't remember there were so many charts there <laughs> that i seen but um it seemed like it was the same 
out of of leaving it standing or going through one of the selective parts. The other thing that I just wanted to observe was when we're moving forward to um, different methods, and it was mentioned here about equipment and expertise. I'm thinking that now um, the province and federal government are working towards UNDRIP. I think these methods of forestry will be coming forefront um, moving forward as, again, I think um, just into the future of, of our vision of what we want to see. And also uh, someone mentioned about the Cowichan River. I think what we do here and what we're, we're going to do from the next steps will be a model for other people to follow. Um, just my thoughts and input. Thank you. Thank you. I have a couple of questions and then Councillor Marsh had her hand up again. Um, really one question, and it goes to the carbon credits piece. When I was at UBCM, I had a discussion with some of the folks from Mosaic and Western, and I forget which one of them, but you know, one of those two has set aside a bunch of land out to the west of us here for, for the carbon credit um, scenario. I think it was Mosaic, and uh, and I, I talked to some of their people, and I go, you know, what's actually required to do that? And I say, well, the first thing you have to have is a plan to log those areas, and then you have to say, oops, now we're not going to log the area, and we're going to set it aside for carbon credits. From a purely operational perspective here in North Cowage, and right now we don't have any plans to log any areas because we put everything on hold for the last three and a half years, um, would the next council, and I'm not even going to be at this table, so I, it's a hypothetical question to me, but would the next council first of all have to authorize staff to say, build us a harvest plan, and then subsequently say, okay, now we're going to cancel that harvest plan so we can get carbon credits? Is that how it actually works, or is there a pathway for us to move from where we are today directly to carbon credits without building harvest plans that we then cancel? What does that look like? Yeah, that, I can ask that one. So really we're talking about this, the question you're talking about is what's called additionality, right? So you have to show that you're changing yeah. um, practices to, to, to enhance carbon storage. And while, you know, the, the comment about having a forest management plan, that, that's not truly a, really accurate. Really what you have to show is that you have a history of, of doing managing the forest in a certain way, right? And so we've seen that history uh, whether it's, you know, 1500 or 15,000 or 17,500, you know, as, as I suggested, um, you have to define a, a baseline scenario and it's typically based on past management activities, but it's also based on economics, right? You, you can, you can base it on, well, this, the, the, if you do a, um, a value assessment on this land base, how will I make money on this? And so you can say, well, by harvesting timber, I can make money on this. And so that's additionality there, right? Is you can show, I can make money, I can legally harvest this and we have a history of harvesting it. And really that's all you need to create a, a, a baseline scenario and to okay. develop a current project. That, that, that answers my question because I, from, from some of those conversations, I was under the impression that the additionality was, was sort of contingent on actually having harvesting plans that were canceled. And you're saying a history is sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Marsh, you had your hand up earlier. Yes, and I, and I think I'd like to ask Mr. Sw Mr. Swaby if I should be asking these folks this or after they're gone. Uh, I just wanted to have it on the record um, how many actual jobs uh, the logging of the mountains provide. And is there a way when the second question would be, second part would be, is there a way to prevent the 50 plus percent of raw logs from leaving the valley if we do any kind of harvesting at all? And I'm not sure if you're the right folks to ask well, that question of so. Well, the, the, the raw log policy, the export policy is a complicated piece that I think the EBC folks are um, somewhat qualified to address because it's a, it's a federal thing that we can't do a whole lot. As I understand it, we have to make them available locally. If there's no demand, they then go um, to the international market. Is that pretty much the quick summary? 
Uh, is Sean there? Sean could probably answer this one. Is our, yeah, there he is. Hi, Mr. Mason. Hi, Mr. Uh, Mayor. Yeah, it's a complicated process, but the short answer is there's a thing called the surplus test, which yeah. speaks to your point that you have to advertise wood and, and any market seller and anything that's left over that's not captured in BC is considered surplus. So yeah. that's a very simple version of what it is. So, c Sean, could could part of what the outcome is, and I'm asking these questions because I I may not be here and I want to understand, um, could it be that we get orders from local uh, mills and if we don't get them, we don't harvest until we do? Is that an option? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Marsh, uh, we can direct the log sales whichever way uh, we'd like. Um, yeah, we could. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Douglas, any more questions for UBC? Because a lot of this stuff is not going to our staff, and we'll get into that and the engagement piece and all the rest of it. But anything yeah, else more for UBC? Go ahead, Councillor Douglas. Yeah, this, this is for UBC, and it was a question that was brought up from one of the Forest Advisory Committee members. And I thought I'd just ask Drs. Uh, Celia and Arcees um, to, to respond to it just for the benefit of Council. But one of the committee members had asked about the possibility of. Uh, implementing different scenarios in, in different parts of the municipal forest reserve. And I believe um, perhaps was, your response, Dr. Silly, was that was something you thought if council and the municipality did uh, explore that option, it would be more uh, de de determined through the uh, forest management plan um, after your work is done. But just wonder if you could elaborate on that for the benefit of council. Yeah. So this is something we discussed before. Yeah, it was my feeling is that trying to kind of get down into the minutia of some different differences in the scenarios is that there's not a lot to gain from doing that from a, a scenario analysis perspective. Really, I think that a lot of those questions come down to operational things that are very specific to, you know, a particular cut block or what you're trying to do at a certain time, right? And so I think that you know the the way that we structured the analysis with the having a, a range of different uh, harvest types and activities and the amounts of volume kind of give you an idea of how any kind of variations of those scenarios might fall probably within you know there'll be some interpolation right between the two. So I, that would be my my response to that. Uh, I don't know. Dr. Arcee, anything to add to that? Because I I I, I love what Councillor Douglas is saying there. But do you have anything to add? No? Okay. Um, I don't really. I would just say that, that, you know, speaking to the biodiversity benefits, the kinds of, again, what, the best thing we can do is predict that those will be outcomes of the amount and juxtaposition of mature and old forests in the future. And so that extrapolation that Brad is suggesting uh, between the kind of bookend scenarios of business as usual versus do nothing, you know, you should try and draw a roughly linear connection between those and the likely outcome of those indicators. But as Brad says, none of them can be modeled perfectly because these are guesses about the future. When we talk about biodiversity, you know, if, if the municipality uh, forests are the only old forests left in the region uh, in hundred years from now, it'd be a very different scenario than if they are juxtaposed to other private lands, which have practiced other uh, older forest management plans. So we, in these kinds of things, that's why Brad is right, I think, in saying we, it's hard to get into the weeds because we'd be making predictions that would really be hard to back up because so much is, there There are contingencies based on the surrounding landscape and the activities of, of course, all other landowners. Because uh, what I heard Councilor Douglas say is, is a lot of what I've been thinking about this in terms of applying different uh, scenarios to different parts, and I don't in any way want to presuppose the outcome of either the public consultation or the First Nations parallel stream that's going on. But let's say at the end of the day that, you know, the, the next council or the Forest Advisory Committee or staff, that everybody comes to a consensus that there are some really important culturally sensitive areas. And, you know, I mean, off the top of my head, I can think the top of Mount Prevost and Stony Hill, just as examples. We say, okay, we're going to apply Scenario four there, it has, it has the benefit of, of dealing with that part of the equation. It has the benefit of the carbon credit piece. And, and then we apply different scenarios perhaps to other parts of, of the forest. Can at the end of the day, 
can we do a blend of these four scenarios in different parts of the MFR? Is the is the operation big enough to sustain that kind of, of a management scenario? I guess that's part of the question. Yeah, I think it's a little bit misleading to think about doing a scenario on a different, because remember that these scenarios are, are they're made up of individual stands that we're modeling, right? <clears throat> and then those stands are sort of summarized over a landscape. And so some of the indicators are looking at at the position of different stands on average, you know, and conditions over the landscape spatially. And and so it becomes a little bit difficult, difficult to extrapolate the way you're talking about. I think the way I'd prefer to look at it would be, okay, yeah, so we want to protect some culturally sensitive areas. So maybe instead of doing, um, you know, 17,000 cubic meters, you drop it down to 12, right? Because you, you're, you're taking out a percentage of this land base that's no longer available for timber harvesting, right? And so I think that would be the way you'd do it. And then you could sort of say, okay, well, the amount of um, area that's being disturbed along with that 12 is gonna be somewhere in between the seven and the 17, right? And so you can kind of extrapolate that way. Right. So it's gonna, it's gonna you know, relate to the amount of harvesting you're doing on the land base pretty much. Any other questions for the UBC folks before we get into the engagement and stuff? And that's more for staff. I see Mr. Swaby's, oh, he popped up and he's gone again. I don't know if he's going to make a comment on yeah, my, Mr. Mayor, my I just, last question. I, I certainly didn't want to leave the public thinking that uh, we don't consider those issues under status quo. In fact, status quo, we, we spent a lot of time about uh, managing aquatic areas, um, cultural areas uh, when, we, when we harvest. So th those are very much on our foresters' mind when, when we were harvesting. So it, this is not a new part to the how we would go about doing any kind of harvesting. I just wanted to be sure we understood that. Yeah, thank you for that. So that was, just to add to that, that was the point I made that when we had the standard net down, like those areas would be included in that standard net down, things that we were trying to protect. Right? Okay, so thank you to the UBC folks. Really appreciated the report. It was a heavy read over the weekend, but uh, good. Thanks again. Yeah. All, right. All right. Thank you. You gentlemen. Thanks very much for the chance to have input. Appreciate it. You gentlemen are excused. And uh, I'm going to entertain from motion or from motion. I'm going to entertain from council the recommended motion here that council endorse the UBC Partnership Group's draft forest management scenario summary as appended to the municipal foresters report dated today and direct staff to proceed with round two of forestry public engagement.